Oh my God, Trinity, whom we adore, help us to forget ourselves entirely so as to establish ourselves in you, unmovable and peaceful as if my, our souls were already in eternity. May nothing be able to trouble our peace or make us leave you, the one changing God, but may each minute bring us more deeply into your mystery. Grant our souls peace. Make them your heaven, your beloved dwelling, and the place of your rest. May we never abandon you there, but may we be there, whole and entire, completely vigilant in our faith, entirely adorned and wholly given over to your action. In Jesus' holy name, and through the intercession of our patrons, we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me welcoming to the dais here. Christopher Carson with Dr. Dennis McNamara. Uh, I'd like to introduce them just to give a brief background. It's my privilege to, to welcome them here, being uh, men that I've known for, for many years, for good or for ill. I am the product of their handiwork. I was a seminarian <laughs> at the seminary where they were teaching and befriending the seminarians who were in formation there. So. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome them here and for them to share the, the great wisdom and teaching that they shared with us. Not that they haven't been hard at work since then. This isn't just the same old stuff. <laughs> this is, in fact, um, cutting edge. Cutting edge liturgical theology, let's say. I'd like to welcome first Christopher Carstens, who is the Director of Worship for the Diocese of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Home of the Shrine of the Dwelling Faith, and other beautiful places. He's a visiting faculty member at the Liturgical Institute at the University of St. Mary of the Lake uh, in Mundelein, and also the editor of Ad Remus Bulletin, one of the voices on the Liturgy Guys podcast, and the author of a number of books, one titled A Devotional Journey into the Mass, A Devotional Journey into the Easter Mystery, as well as Principles of Sacred Liturgy. Forming a sacramental vision, a copy of which I have here. Woo. A wonderful book. <laughs> One that I reviewed, and my review did not make the cut. So <laughs> that's uh, a testament to its greatness. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Chris, for being here tonight. Dr. Dennis McNamara is an associate professor and Executive Director of the Center for Beauty and Culture at Benedictine College, a position that he began just a few years ago, 2019, pre-pandemic, to aid the college's mission. And their mission is to transform culture in America. And we do that one act of worship and one act of beauty at a time. He holds a BA in the History of Art from Yale, his PhD in Architectural History from UVA, and for nearly 20 years was a member of the faculty at the Liturgical Institute, uh, where Christopher Carstens also teaches a graduate program that was founded by Francis Cardinal George. I was Chris's teacher. <laughs> <laughs> also a prolific author, Dr. McNamara has written many articles on art, architectural, and theology and culture. Many of you know him as the speaker from our Revel back in last uh, back in April and kicked us off in grand style with a wonderful presentation, a riveting presentation. Um, he has written books, uh, excuse me, articles for Munio, uh, Sacred Architecture, Homiletic and Pastoral Review. He's written uh, regularly published in the Magnificat. You may have caught his writings there if you subscribe to that. And also of Adoramus Bulletin. Um, his books, my favorite, happens to be a book written about how to read a church. A little handbook that you can take on you when you go to your dream trip to Europe, right? To be able to understand what it is that you're seeing and the beauty of the, uh, the architecture, what all of that means and where it came from. But his favorite book uh, is Catholic Church Architecture and the Spirit of the Liturgy, a, a beautiful masterpiece expounding these mysteries in a coherent way. So. Hope you get a chance, if this talk tonight meets your standards, to check those books out. So both of them, part of the reason why we're having them here tonight, 
is that they are co-authoring a book on solemnities, the solemnities of the church published by Ascension Press. And as those solemnities are expressed in great works of art. So we're going to have a little conversation tonight, allow them to talk about some of the things that they've put together in book form here with us tonight. So please, a great welcome to our speakers, Chris Carstens and Jess McNamara. So I think the best place to start is why why a book on solemnities now? What what is it that this teaching is is meeting? What is it what is the need that it's answering in our church and in our culture? Dan, you want me to answer this? Okay. <laughs> Actually before uh, uh, before the talk we were discussing some of the questions we might uh, answer. And when Father Blaha mentioned this one, Dennis and I kind of looked at each other and pointed to the other one to <laughs> try to answer. Because uh, actually, uh, truth be told, uh, we were just told to write these things, but we didn't really know the mind of uh, Ascension uh, too deeply on what was the motivation for a book on solemnities, like you said. Uh, however, I've uh, since uh, become privy to the answer to that, uh, Dennis. Uh, so in the next issue of the Adoramus Bulletin, Ascension Press is uh, writing uh, about and they lay out uh, the motivation for a book on solemnities. And their answer goes something like this, that uh, in God's interactions with the creation and then uh, choosing a chosen people and establishing the church, this, uh, let's call it this greatest story ever told, um, there are certain events, ancestors, uh, figures, uh, things that happen uh, in this story that many people today are not familiar with. Uh, what's more is that many people today, like us in this room, uh, don't realize that we are a, we're a character in this greatest story ever told. And in fact, we have like a chapter in this greatest story ever told. And part of that chapter makes sense only in light of what's gone before us. And what's gone before us is, for example, the person of John the Baptist, the birth of uh, John the Baptist. And the Annunciation of, uh, 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 from Gabriel to Mary and the birth of Jesus and the coming of the wise men and all of these events that make up the solemnities. So part of Ascension's motive for a book on solemnities was to teach Catholics of today sort of our, our history, our traditions, our roots. Now, Dennis here can speak to this uh, very precisely, I think, part of a modernism or postmodernism is to forget all of this stuff. You know, if it's old, it's bad. If it's, if it's going to be good, it's got to be new. So we don't need the memories, we don't need the history, we don't need the traditions, we don't need the body of the church. And so in uh, too many cases, most of us don't know much about this. So again, part of uh, Ascension's uh, reasoning for a book on solemnities was was to teach Catholics today, because there's a great interest, is there not, today on things traditional. Where did this come from? Why do we do it this way? Why do we no longer do it this way? What, what am I missing out on? It would be to teach us about where we've come from, who we are, and uh, perhaps where we're going. And solemnities, as you know, are the highest feasts of the church year, and there are many we know, of course, this year Christmas, but this birth of John the Baptist is a solemnity, which is the only other birthday other than the Virgin Mary and, and Christ is actually celebrated in the entire liturgical calendar. Somebody's birthday. Most saints' birthdays are their, are their death dates, their birth into heaven. Uh, but only the Virgin Mary, John the Baptist, and, um, and Christ have a birthday on the calendar. And so the idea of a liturgical year at all, I learned a lot of this from a great little book by David Fagerberg from Notre Dame. It's called The Christian Meaning of Time. And he mentions that time is a creature. So it's something created by God. It's not a four-legged creature, but it's a creature. And angels didn't need time to make their choice for God or against God because they had supernatural intellect. But time is an evidence of God's mercy, and he gives us this cycle every year to play out all the mysteries of the life of Christ. And when you're five, you know, Christmas is more about presents and trees than it is about incarnation. When you're ten, you understand a little more. And the cycle goes again and again and again, and every time you're different when you experience the liturgical year. And so the church has arranged this for us. So over time to say, yes, now I understand a little more about the Incarnation. I understand what it means for me to say yes to Christ. And then a year later, I'll, I'll say it a little more deeply. And so these cycles, these principal uh, 
face in the church and the particular ones that are pulled out for us to contemplate and, and meditate. And so I guess Ascension wants to bring that out a little more than it used to be. One of the things I learned about to writing this book, and I'll hand this back to you in a second here, Father, uh, is that how many solemnities are there? Anybody? Shout it out. <laughs> Forty. Seventeen. <laughs> You'll have your proper solemnities of St. Philip Mary and things like that. Yeah. Seventeen. I, could you name the seventeen solemnities? I mean, that, if we had more time, we could go through and do that too. But I mean, these are the great events in, you know, you all have your own events, you know, the day of your birth, the day you, you got engaged, the day that you start having children, the day you got your first job, and those things, you know, are make you what you are today. Well, these 17 solemnities make us who we are as well. And so this book helps to, uh, helps to uncover them. Well, we want to get into some of those solemnities tonight. You graciously brought some of the material and some imagery for us to, to review. And a, a, several solemnities that we can go through tonight in particular and maybe in greater detail. Um, I've read a copy, an advanced copy of the book. It's it's a, it's a solemn experience to, to hold a, a beautiful work that communicates something of the sublime in the way that we talk about and think about and pray about these mysteries of God. But maybe, maybe before we dive into the imagery associated with these individual solemnities, the, the question of imagery itself is obviously a fraught one in the history of our faith, right? The iconoclastic movement, which sought to eliminate all images from church seemingly in accordance with scripture itself, right? That thou shalt make thou shalt not make a graven image. So though, though that may be uh, an overly simplistic way of putting it, what, what would we say, how would we articulate the importance of imagery to the faith and how would we, artic how would we explain the way imagery itself articulates the faith? Well, you know, the uh, Eastern churches, uh, the Orthodox churches, in part are called Orthodox because of right belief about images. And we don't know, we don't think of that. So the Eastern Orthodox Church, what are the Orthodox about? There were several centuries of iconoclastic controversies in the 800s and 900s, and it was so important to them to get this right that the new emperor would come in and forbid their being icons, and they'd take them all out of the churches and burn them. And the iconographers who insisted on making new icons would have their hands cut off, they'd be executed, and it's a serious business, right? It's violating the law of God, seemingly. You know, the golden calf story, and make no graven image. Um, and then the next emperor would come in and say, yeah, I think that's all right. And then finally, the, the next one went, and then they fought about this for centuries, like civil war almost, uh, in Greece and in, in Constantinople. And then finally they settled the question, mostly because of John Damascene, the great uh, saint, John Damascus. And he said, we can make images of God because God chose to make an image of himself. So the invisible, unknowable, unreachable God, the Father, as we think of him, sent his son to take a form, to take a shape. The, the phrase, the word they use is circumscribed. He drew a line around himself. And therefore, if God chose to be knowable through matter, then we can do what God did and make images knowable through matter. Right? And so the two moments, biblical moments, that they always hold up are the incarnation, of course, because the incarnation of Christ is made of stuff, right? He's calcium and carbon and water, and he looks like something. And so matter can reveal God. Christ said, he who sees me sees the Father. So, all right, well, this, this seems like a pretty good uh, reference, that matter can reveal God. And then on Mount Tabor, the transfiguration, his body becomes dazzlingly white, and even his clothes become dazzlingly white. In other words, humanity and divinity are now existing in the earth, the realm. And so not only can the incarnation show that it reveals God, matter, it can also reveal God's glory, right? This is elevated, redeemed creation. And that settled the question. And so they had a feast of the triumph of orthodoxy that's put in their liturgical calendar, they still have it, and it's right belief about icons. And if you read your catechism in the Catholic Church, the little section on sacred images says, we can do this because Christ did it. Footnote, John Damascene, 780, and nobody's topped it since then. So he settled the question so well, there was nothing else to say. But that's why we say it, because Christ did it. You know, this one used to be a Protestant church, if I understand it properly. And so they have stained glass, but notice no figural images in it, because they have this different view of what matter is, and matter doesn't have the capacity to bear uh, divinity or the glory of God. And so they'll have something that's pretty, but it's not claiming to be transparent to heavenly realities. The Catholic worldview is, yeah, creation is fallen, it's wounded, but it is still good. And so we can worship the Eucharist. I don't know if that ever 
surprises you. What's the name of the book that's called you use when you have adoration, the rates in it? It's called Worship. Holy Communion and Worship of the Eucharist Outside of Mass. Yeah, Worship of the Eucharist Outside of Mass. That's how much we believe that matter can be the bearer of divinity in the real presence, and that it can be worshipped when it has the right uh, transformation. And so images are a lot less lower in the hierarchy than that, but it's the same theological principle. It's amazing to contemplate as we dive into these images that uh, people fought and died to give us the right to look at them. So yeah, we can keep that in mind as we, as we do that. And, and maybe as a follow-up thought to that, Chesterton, um, Chesterton often pointed out how Catholicism, in a sense, dethroned nature by emptying it of divinity. That is, we don't worship the trees and the rivers and the, and the stars. It's been, it's been de-divinized. It's been naturalized. And that nature is now not our father or mother, but our sister. But that in this unique way, in these sacramental ways, nature has been caught back up into the mystery of, of the divine in a way that elevates it far beyond maybe what it would have been in a kind of foggy or dark or mysterious way in a, a time before revelation. So let's dive in. Um, let's dive into some of these images. We've, we've chosen a few solemnities to go through, uh, including the one that's coming up next. Can anyone tell us what, no priests or liturgists can answer this. What is the next? Yeah. Last. That's just a hint. So yeah, that'll be a hint. What's the next solemnity? Can anyone tell us? Very good. Yeah, I can't sneak one by this crowd. <laughs> So the Feast of All Saints, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And they, the, the, so the book, the, the book on solemnities that they've written, is a short introduction to the idea of what a solemnity is, uh, what they are, and then a, a work of art that captures the mystery of that solemnity, and then very specific ways that that solemnity can be lived out and celebrated concretely in, in culture, in life, music, uh, activities, right? So a, a really beautiful resource that you've, that you've put together. I enjoyed reading it, um, the events copy that I got. But the Feast of All Saints, tell us, tell us about that. How, what would be the best way to approach this? What is the Feast of All Saints? What is it the Feast of, if that's too obvious a question? Yeah, it's, a, it's such an obvious question, the answer is maybe not so obvious. I mean, who, who do we celebrate on this day, on the Feast of All Saints? Uh, the answer is, um, well, this is how I came to an answer. So. Uh, so each of the 17 solemnities, I wrote the first part on sort of the, the history, the, the liturgy, the, 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 uh, the biblical foundations of, of the solemnity, and then Dr. McNamara wrote on, the, on a work of art, and then the third author, Alexis Katarna, wrote on how to, how to live it. So when I wrote uh, my section of each of these solemnities, I went through the Roman Missal, and I looked at every single prayer that had to do with, for example, All Saints. Then I went to the Breviary, and I went through every single prayer that had to do with All Saints. And then I went to the lectionary for Mass, and I went through all the readings for All Saints. And I almost did kind of a, kind of a, a quick lexio uh, on all of these texts to see what was uh, going to rise to the surface. And one of the things that, uh, not that I just want to tell you, this is something I learned about uh, putting this uh, chapter together, is who does it celebrate? And on the one hand, it's, it celebrates... All of those souls in heaven, all of those saints that are now in heaven. So we know St. Philip Neri and uh, St. Peter and St. Francis of Assisi are saints here below. We call them saints. But there are thousands, there's a multitude, too numerous to be counted, that we don't know and we don't identify them as S-I-N-T, fill in the blank. Well, they're as saintly as uh, St. Philip Neri, for example, and the rest. And this day is really their day. And the texts of this uh, solemnity attest to that. But one of the other things that uh, came, to, came to my mind came from the Office of Readings for um, the Solemnity of All Saints. And it's from St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And he starts to suggest that this solemnity is also your feast day and my feast day. That um, signifies the sanctity that we're called to and the heavenly destiny that we're called to. So in a certain sense, St. Bernard says, it's a feast day that belongs to all of us 
that reminds us that if you're going to live like these people in the heavenly Jerusalem, your ticket has to say saint on it. If it doesn't say saint, fill in the blank, Sherry, Chris, Dennis, then you're not going to get in. Okay? Because the, the price of admission to heaven is sanctity. And it got me thinking that I, probably all of us are, we're not presuming on heaven, but we probably think our chances are pretty good, right? We do do the right things. But probably a lot fewer of us actually think, I'm going to be called, I'm going to be a saint. And it's that disparity, I think, that this day helps to, uh, to bring together. Yeah, the tension between hope and presumption is, is, always, is always very real. That's beautiful. Thanks for that uh, little crib homily you just provided. <laughs> <laughs> it's on page 47. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's dive into this image here. Dennis, tell us what's, what, tell us how to read this to those of us raised on internet comics and, and uh, who are, we're a little overwhelmed by how, how to approach this. <laughs> well, this is an image from a book of hours, a very famous book of hours. You can see it's the hours of Etienne Chevalier's mid-15th uh, century. And it's probably it's considered one of the greatest works of art of the entire Western tradition. Very few people know about it. The actual image in this book of hours, this is literally the hours, is only eight inches high. So you can imagine how tiny those faces are on those angels and saints, you know, three-eighths of an inch, an eighth of an inch. And it comes at the end of the year, it's called the Trinity in its glory, but I picked it for all saints for a variety of reasons. One of the things about saints is saints are members of the body of Christ. Right? So we talk about the mystical body of Christ being the church, it's a continuing action of Christ in the world. So just as Christ was teaching and governing and healing and sanctifying, now we have the church as the hierarchical structure that does Christ's work, and the members of the church are the members of this body. So I'm an architectural historian, I tend to think architecturally, and there's the famous moment of John where the, the apostles are looking at the temple, and Christ says, I'll tear this down in three days and rebuild it. Then they said, he's speaking of the temple of his body. So what does it mean? Many members of a building, you look around here, you have beams and brackets and wood beams on the floor and ceiling tiles. These are all piles in the construction site, and then they're put in the right order. And people are seated where we all came from tonight, and then we sit together. If this were worship, we'd be doing what Christ does, which is praising God. So this idea that saints are living stones in the temple of God, but they're also members of the mystical body. So I, I don't know if you could find this in the patristic footnote for me, Chris. Uh, but if you could, I'd love to hear that the Feast of All Saints is a feast of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? because every saint is a member of God. This is how the Eastern iconographers solve this problem. Well, you can make an image of Christ, sure, but what about a saint? And that seems to draw glory away from uh, Christ. And the answer is no. Every member of the body who is a saint has been sanctified by Christ and is therefore living as one of the members of, of that body. And so you see how these uh, people are all set up in this perfect arrangement. These are uh, virgins over here, uh, virgin martyrs. There are bishops, maybe you can see the pointy hats uh, running across here. Moses is over there, and uh, David has his little harp. And then in the blue and the red, these are all the faces of angels. I think I have a close-up of it here, so you can see it a little better. See, that these are actually uh, winged angels, uh, and the, the seraphim are here. They're, it's like they're made of fire. And there's three Jesuses, which is kind of weird, or at least it looks like three Jesuses. This was an old convention uh, that's actually explicitly forbidden by the Latin church now. But Christ said, he who sees me sees the Father. Nobody knew what the Father looked like. Uh, we paint him sometimes as an old man with a white beard, but they didn't want to do that. So the Father looks like Jesus, we know, because Christ said it. And then, well, the Holy Spirit's one with them, too. So this was the way of representing the Trinity. And then they give the Virgin Mary her own little seat over there. Right? So she's the queen of all saints, so she gets a special place uh, in that arrangement. And then there are these four winged creatures here. Maybe you can see the lion and the ox. Uh, actually, if you go back, there, there's a couple more up there. Those represent the four evangelists uh, from the book of Revelation's description when St. John sees uh, heaven. And the scripture says, when those four evangelists call the saints to prayer, they fall on their face and worship, holy, holy, holy. And so they're kind of like the deacons of the heavenly liturgy, right? Deacons always tell you what to do, you know, go, do this, do this, listen to this. So they're doing what uh, they're serving, and then these people are all singing, holy, holy, holy. And I started to think about how the Gothic cathedrals look just like this. Now, there's, this is not an art historical kind of footnote you can make. But see these angels coming around here in this architectonic arrangement, and then you go over the door of a great Gothic cathedral, and you have the angels and saints arranged in the same way. 
So the building is the church, it's the temple, it's the many members, they're all rightly assembled. And then this is actually another um, image by Fouquet where this is called King David building the Temple of Solomon. You would think this would be King Louis building, you know, Notre Dame or something. Because they imagine the, the, the Temple of Solomon as being made of all these many members. And see, it's almost like everything's made of people and angels and saints. Uh, just like Christ's body is made of many members of buildings and Christ's body and the many saints assembled are all kind of uh, one thing. Here's a little detail of the people at the bottom. So here are the religious orders and the laity. And so there's, it's like this, I sometimes compare it to a pizza, you know, that one slice of the angels, one slice of the saints, one slice of the laity. And so the, the, the assembly of all saints is much broader, I think, often than we think. And then there they all are in a painting. Eight inches high, you know, my hand, I measure my hand because I like to measure buildings with it. My hand's eight inches high, exactly. So imagine those little faces, and they have different expressions. You can see them close up. Some of them are more happy than others. Here you can see the, the virgin martyrs there and the bishops uh, with their hats. An amazing uh, thing by Jean Fouquet and his ability to paint with a paintbrush that just had a single hair on it. And that's how these tiny little um, faces were made. <laughs> So, is there any sense to the to the to the is there how do we see the hierarchy of that image there in, in its whole, and what does what does that hierarchy mean? How, how does that we have virgin martyrs uh, on the left? What did you say? Uh, let's see who they are over there. There's more bishops there. I think they're virgin martyrs on both sides. You can see the bishops, mitres. Okay. King, there's King David right there. Maybe you can just make out his harp and his crown. Oh, yeah. So uh, he's pulled out differently. So, you know, traditionally the, virgin, the women were lower in the hierarchy of things to see how the missiles are arranged today. Except for the Virgin Mary, who's always exceptional uh, out there. But you have these angels who are created uh, to be near the throne of God. And then you have the choirs of angels. And then you have different people hierarchically arranged within the of the church. And hierarchy doesn't mean bad. People at the bottom of the hierarchy, if they're doing what they're meant to be doing, are happy uh, doing that. And so everybody's in the right place and not in a place they'd rather not be. So being low in the hierarchy in a painting like this doesn't mean you're unimportant. It just means a three-year-old's not ready to drive the car, you know, and they're not ready to, to run the house. <laughs> so, you see, I interpreted that just the opposite. I saw them as being the front, as being the most important. The front? Oh, because they're here? Yeah, you could imagine it very much like this uh, arrangement here. If you go in the cathedral, you're being welcomed by all these figures, including Christ with his hands raised there. So I think I mentioned in the book, it's these people on earth are being welcomed to the throne of God uh, by the angels and saints on each side. So it speaks a lot of their dignity. It's like, come on in. Uh, this is the wedding feast of eternity, and we want you here to about this About this hierarchy, uh, a common teacher of ours was this David Fagerberg that uh, Dennis mentioned before, and he would quip that hierarchy is not spelled H-I-G-H-E-R-P. It comes from this word hieros, which means priestly or sacred, like, uh, like hieroglyphics or sacred writings. And so the hierarchy, in fact, depicted here isn't simply or even primarily who's closer to God, you know, in proximity. You know, everybody in this, in this depiction is a, is, is a hierophant, is a priest, is joining in the, the priesthood uh, of Jesus, um, which is what makes them to be a saint. And in fact, they used to say, they, they, apparently this was an ancient tradition or ancient belief. It was never canonized by the church, but um, that a martyr at the moment of his or her martyrdom would be able to confect the Eucharist. Now, the, as they say, the church never approved this, but the instinct is spot on, they say, because when you are about to be martyred, you're conforming yourself in life and in death to the priestly offering of Jesus. And that bestows this priestly power upon the martyr because the conformity to the, to the great hierophant, the great priest, is in his or her bones. You know, Joan of Arc, at the moment she's being burned at the stake, the thinking would have gone, could have uh, uh, confected uh, the Eucharist. So th there's this great relationship between the saints and Christ and the Eucharist and the priesthood that again, if uh, we want our ticket punched, uh, somehow it's going to include all of those things. Well, I, I don't know if any of you were astounded by that. I've never read that before. That's, that's, uh, that's really beautiful. I'm thinking immediately of the account of the martyrdom of St. Polycarp. 
Do, do you all know that account? So it's the martyrdom of St. Polycarp. He was burned at the stake, and a great cloud of flame circled around him like a sail being filled with wind. And onlookers who are witnessing this are filled with this, their noses are filled with the scent of baking bread. It says even the prayer he offered upon his martyrdom was patterned after the style of a Eucharistic prayer. This is my body. Give it up. In, in, if he who gives his life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel. That's, that's astounding. So in some sense, martyrdom, martyrdom is the unsurpassable act of sanctity. So, right, the Second Vatican Council talked a lot about active participation, and it's active participation in the saving work of Jesus. And if you really are serious about that, martyrdom is the best way to do it. <laughs> if you're not ready for that step yet, the Eucharist is the next best way to do it. But they're the, they're the same type of thing. They're, one is uh, conforming your, your life and death to, to Jesus in your bones, and one is eating the life and death of Jesus so that your bones are become those his. And another way is changing diapers for 14 years, right? Because you're giving up your sleep, you're giving up your nose, you're giving up a lot of things as a martyr for the goodness of your children, right? And so that's a shared Christ, even if it's not as kind of glamorous as uh, the other kinds of martyrs. And there's lots of ways to, to pour out your life for others in the world. And it comes to the guy with no kids, but I know you have, you have eight, right? Well, it comes back to the body, right? That matter is capable of bearing the divine. And when when we limit our freedom through loving commitment, sanctified by the sacraments, our bodies become capable of bearing Christ. This is my body. That's, that's, um, that's an astounding thought, wonderful thing. I had another uh, question that I was going to ask, but I forgot it. So, <laughs> I would, uh, anything else that you want to to make sure that we say about this feast of, of or the solemnity of all saints. Should we go to the next one? We'll go to the next one. I, 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 yeah. We've pretty much tapped this one. Out. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It's the kind of thing we can return to again and again. But I, I would actually have a great interest in the in the next solemnity that we had, we had resolved to discuss, being a pastor of a parish named Christ the King, is, is the solemnity of Christ the King. Um, and... This one, this one has all sorts of backstories to it, and uh, you know, it's a it's a relatively recent solemnity in the history of the church. Um, what this is a maybe an obvious question to answer, maybe more difficult than what is the feast of the solemnity of all saints about? But what what is the solemnity of Christ the King actually celebrating? Chris, do you want to answer that? Yeah, uh, give it a try, Father. <laughs> uh, yeah, as you say, it, it's this is a relatively uh, recent solemnity added to the calendar in 1925. Uh, Pius, uh, somebody, 11th, I think, uh, added it in 1925. But um, what's, what some of the things I came across seemed to indicate was that um, there were already solemnities of Christ the King on the calendar. So before uh, the presentation tonight, we heard... Uh, what child is this? <laughs> this, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. And the, and the, the man, those are the words, the magi, and the magi then bring gifts to Christ the King. And it's this great battle of kings, King Herod and the, king, the baby King Jesus and the kings from the east. So um, some of the readings suggested that the initial feast of Christ the King was the Epiphany. The Epiphany. Um, another is uh, 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 the solemnity of the Sacred Heart. So when that, um, the, the Holy Father, when he instituted this, I don't remember when, uh, he wanted this, uh, the, the, the consecration of families and individuals to the Sacred Heart of Jesus on the Feast of Christ the King. Right? So Christ could reign in our hearts. So solemnity of the Sacred Heart is kind of a Christ the King solemnity too. And the third observation was that when this solemnity of Christ the King was first instituted, it was placed on the last Sunday of October, which would be this Sunday. 
And then what's next Tuesday? All Saints. So that Jesus is the King of All Saints. He's the King of Holiness. So what some of the things that I read in putting this part of the chapter together is that, you know, a lot of these solemnities of the church year are sort of recapitulated under the crown and headship of this final, final solemnity of the church year, that of Christ the King. And so it kind of it kind of puts an exclamation point on a lot of the things we've done already and reminds us going as we conclude one liturgical year and going into the other that this is all about living uh, happily and eternally in the uh, kingdom of Christ the King. So that's what I think it's about. It's, uh, the end game is living in that uh, kingdom. One of my favorite stories from Pius XI when he made this uh, solemnity, he wrote this document saying, Popes write documents and nobody reads them, so uh, let's, let's put this on the liturgical calendar to bring this into the life of everyday people. Which is kind of true, right? If, if somebody writes some document, you don't read it. But I, I thought it was just ironic that the Pope's writing a document lamenting that nobody reads documents by Popes. <laughs> and so, I guess to put it in the liturgical calendar to get some attention, but I guess it's true. Well, it, I mean, it, the idea is sound. And lines up. Chesterton students, Dr. Murray would be asking you right now, what's the, the philosophical principle? One begins with the end in mind. You cannot, you cannot uh, fashion a castle without knowing what it costs and knowing what it's for. So that it would be on the last, year, last Sunday of the liturgical year um, is, is fitting. It's philosophically sound, as the popes often are. Not always. <laughs> so, tell us uh, then, how, what, what image have you chosen for us to, to consider this solemnity, this mystery, and what does well, it mean? this is the great mosaic in the dome of the Florence Baptistry. And what I was trying to avoid was some kind of little sweet holy card of Jesus with a crown looking kind of effeminate and pleasant, right? I wanted something that would show Christ in majesty. And so this is the famous baptistry in Florence. There's the Duomo. And then here's the image of Christ there. And this is all of salvation history and scriptural history. So he's the biggest figure you can see. He's the king of all of that. When you see it close up, uh, there he is. So this is from the 13th century. And the West has an iconic tradition too. We tend to think of icons as, as exclusively Eastern. But the East and the West had an iconic tradition for a very long time together. And they, they split out a certain way. There's a lot of interesting things going on here. You know, these visions of Christ in majesty or Christ in heaven are almost always based on the vision of St. John in the book of Revelation. So in chapter 4, chapter 20, chapter 21, he talks about how he was on the island of Patmos on the Sabbath, which is, you know, the, the days that the priests would do what they do. And he saw a tear in the sky, and he looked through this tear in the sky, and he saw this vision on the other side. So if you know your temple theology, you know there's the veil, the big great curtain between the Holy of Holies and the Temple of Solomon, and then the big room outside. The Holy of Holies was heaven, and the big room outside was earth. And so when the veil was torn, when Christ died on the cross, what it means is all this glory of heaven could rush into the world. And the people on earth could see into the glory of heaven because the great curtain was, was gone. And so this is the vision that's often used for Christ's glory. Seated on the throne, surrounded by an emerald rainbow, these white-robed elders around him, angels and saints singing holy, holy, holy. Which is why we sing holy, holy, holy. Uh, you know, when you go to Mass next time, right before the Sanctus, here, like, pay attention to the, the preface. It has a little something about the Feast of the Day, and it almost always ends with, we join our voices with the angels and the saints as we cry out, holy, holy, holy. That's the pre-existing song of heaven. That's what they call the holy stutter. I remember when the, the uh, Cubs won the World Series, uh, our, our former work, um, uh, Jesse, what did we call him? Our co-worker. He just couldn't talk. He was like, we won, we won, we won. Right? That's all you can say. So the angels and saints are looking at the throne of God, and all they can say is, holy, holy, holy. Right? So, and, you know, to have that intention in that moment. Um, and so that's what I wanted to think. How can we represent the reality of Christ? So it has a bit of this Eastern tradition. It's made in mosaic, which is a lot of little tiny pieces, little pieces of stone for the most part. But remember, stones, this is something I drill into the students of meditation all the time. What are stones? And they go, stones are people. What do the stones assembled make? The temple. What's the temple? Christ. What's Christ made of? Many members rightly assembled. Right? It's a very simple theology. But if you think what a mosaic is, it's a pile of rocks, right? And there's great bins, and they don't make anything. And then every little piece by itself, the size of your thumbnail, doesn't, doesn't say anything. 
Then they're assembled properly and the face of Christ appears. Think about your school here, you know, before the school gets started, before it gets organized, everybody's doing whatever. Suddenly everybody assembles and organizes hierarchically in this great phenomenon of the, the teaching authority of Christ manifests itself in your classrooms and your teachers and the lives of students. So mosaic is a very particular kind of uh, thing. And so you can see Christ's uh, garments look like they're on fire. This little golden streaks there, they're called adding the fire to his clothing because his clothing in heaven is like the best chasuble you've ever seen. It's the garment of salvation that he wears at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting on this uh, rainbow, which goes all the way back to Noah as the sign of reconciliation between God and humanity. So the final reconciliation between God and humanity is the end of the world, right? The end of the world we usually think is bad news, but the end of the world is really good news because it's the end of the fallen world. There's no more sin, there's no more sorrow, there's no more death, so we're looking forward to this. And so Christ, I like just that his face was not angry. You know, the, I think sometimes Orthodox Catholics can fall into the Jansenist heresy a little bit of this overly rigid, overly demanding God who makes unrealistic expectations for our perfection. And so he's not angry, even though some souls down here are getting dragged off to hell and the others are going to heaven, but he's not just in a snit, right? He's, this is the bringer of justice. I remember our mutual friend, uh, Father Scott Harder, gave his first homily at the seminary as a deacon. This is what everybody would look forward to. It's like the first time you hear your friends give a homily. And he said, I'm going to preach about God's wrath today. I don't know if you remember this. And everybody was like, the wrath of God. And it was a trick because the wrath of God is the bringing of justice and love, right? We think wrath is God on a bad day when that was coffee, right? That's not God. It's God is giving each what they actually deserve. And in love, he's restoring order to the world again. And that's what Christ the King uh, does here. There's a couple of funny things about it. He's got one hand facing one direction and one hand facing the other direction. That's his marker of his activity in heaven and his activity on earth. And if you look at him from the waist up, he's pretty straightforward, looking right at you. That's his kind of heavenly perfection. And then from the waist down, he starts to turn. And he's walking around on earth, and so to speak. And you can see his feet step inside the circle. The circle is called the mandorla. That's the traditional representation of kind of an opening between heaven and earth. And then you either get access to heaven or heaven comes to you. So you can see his head is on the inside. But then the rest of his body is in this heavenly glory. And then his feet are stepping forward. And his knees are turned as if he's ready to come and redeem the world. And so this is the vision of Christ who brings justice, who has wrath in the proper sense, but uh, in love. And then it's made of all these little pieces, and then even looks like they're gems surrounding him here. Because if you think of stones as members of the temple, and the temple is the body, what are, what are gems? They're stones that are precious. They're stones that have been cut and polished. And so many of the church documents will talk about gems as being like saints where people come out of the womb, kind of a misshapen little rock, you know, we can't talk, we're really concerned about ourselves, and little by little, mom and dad say, eat your vegetables, do your homework, stop hitting your sister, clean your room, go to confession, go to communion. This is the polishing and the cutting that God does to the other members of the Muslim body. And then they're assembled as a gem in this sort of great mosaic of heaven. And so the book of Revelation talks about heaven as being composed of these 12 gems um, that are on the foundation stones of the wall. So if you've gone to a church and said, oh yeah, the stained glass looks like gems, and the chalice has gems on it, and the paintings on the walls are sapphire blue and ruby red and gold leaf, and I see this gem-like perfection, that's kind of the intuition of nature brought to glory, just what you're saying. Nature lost its divinity because it got divinized, right? And so all of creation is now brought to the highest level of glory, just like us as little rocks on the street, hopefully will become a diamond and a sapphire and amethyst. Then um, there are 12 gems on the priest's breastplate in the temple. If you ever read this, it's very boring reading in some ways, but you have 12 gems that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So even all the way back to Exodus, you have um, gems representing uh, people. And one of the things I love best that I discovered in the research, the book of Revelation says he appears like Jasper and Carnelian, which are two of the gems of the high priest's breastplate. Jasper was the first one for the tribe of Reuben, who was the oldest brother. And Carnelian was the twelfth one for Benjamin, who was the youngest brother. So in other words, Jesus looks like the first and the last, the great and the weak, the strong, you know. So in other words, this, he is now made up of, of all of us, Jews, Gentiles. There's a lot you can find in just a little image uh, like this. You could, do, you could do another half hour on this, but I won't. <laughs> 
You need one of those in your church, Father. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even ever been to the St. Louis Basilica. The Basilica there to see the mosaics. Yeah, you know, I just was able to see that for the first time back in April. And, uh, I hope to see again with that in mind. The gemstones. The pressure that compresses our our death, right? What is what is a what is a diamond but compressed death? All of the vegetable matter, carbon that's been cooked and pressurized. And then cut and polished, right? So and, and nature, cut. the best of nature then has to get cut and polished. So the best of us in nature then gets cut and polished by the grace of God through the instrumentality of the members of the church. The pearls are the same thing, right? Pearls a little bit of irritant in an oyster, and it transforms into this kind of um, beautiful thing. The pearly gates of heaven are, are like that. In other words, creation has been brought to this high level of, of glory. Amazing. Uh, so thank you. Let's let's not having exhausted this at all. Much more we could be said. I have many questions, but let's move to our third our third solemnity. And talk through a little bit of the next solemnity in the calendar, the solemnity of the Nativity of Christ. And so here we have here we have an image uh, for our, for our consideration. Um, where, where to begin here? First, let's begin with the same question: What, in the danger of being too terribly obvious, what is the the solemnity of the Nativity, Chris? What is it? What are we celebrating? Uh, we celebrate your occasion to become God. Wait, no, I got that mixed up. No, I think that is it. <laughs> There's, uh, um, pay attention to the, uh, to the texts that appear throughout Advent, especially as they get closer to Christmas. And there appears this, um, this line uh, in various forms, but it basically comes down to this. Maybe some of you have heard this when the when the priest or the deacon pours uh, water into the chalice at Mass. He says this prayer that is that goes, um, By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. May we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. And this little uh, snippet there that you hear at every Mass when the priest or deacon adds the water sh pops up all over the place during Advent, especially as you approach Christmas. Because what it, um, well, what, what I think is trying to remind us is, that, you know, we're, we're good at the first part of the mystery, that God became man. But that's only half the story. It's not the, the, the telos, right? It's not the end game. The end game is... Uh, why did God become man so that man might become God? And this is what that line in every Mass is, and this is what the Advent and Christmas liturgies start to repeat over and over and over again. And the, uh, uh, read, the, read the Office of Readings from St. Leo the Great on Christmas Day. It's this mystery all over again. It's called, uh, in the tradition, the uh, I think the Admirabili, Commercio, the most admirable commerce. And it's about this great gift exchange that happens uh, at Christmas, and which is, I suppose, the real, re the real meaning behind uh, the season, the real meaning behind every gift, is that we do this gift exchange in Christ uh, with God the Father at every Christmas. Um, St. Augustine puts it most tersely, um, we gave God the power to die, and he gives us the power to live. We give God the gift of being able to die, and God gives us the gift of being able to become divine. And this, I think, is what the, the you do this little lexio through all the texts, and this is the message that, at least in my reading, started to pop to the surface. It's not simply about cute baby Jesus and changing diapers, Dennis. Uh, it's about the, the end game of that is that so we'll be you know like those gems like like you're saying so um, yeah a little attention attention to the text I think uh, bears that out so see if see if you agree with me as we go uh, through the next Advent and Christmas seasons 
And I think we do get used to the idea of the incarnation as if it's, you know, oh, hello, God became man, we might become God. You have to pause a second and say, we might become God. <laughs> There's the dialogue of the Trinity, and the Father is the lover, the Son is identical and yet other, and is the beloved, and the Holy Spirit is the love between them. And they have this perfect relationship, and none of us have perfect relationships. And the invitation is because Christ took on humanity, and we become his body, we can enter into this community of, of the divine, of infinite perfection, of infinite happiness, and that only happened by God taking on our nature to bring us into his nature. It's just a, it's a thing beyond comprehension, so much more interesting than, you know, uh, jingle bells, and, and even the, the little cards with sweet mothers and babies on them. It's like, we like mothers and babies, but it's a lot more than that, right? This is the majestic moment. Gerard Manley Hopkins, I think, called it in, Infinity dwindled to infancy. You know, the, at the fall, we grasped for something beyond us, and at our redemption, he who was infinitely beyond us became weak and small and tiny um, to uh, invite us into his majesty. It's just a it's phenomenal, mind-blowing concept. I'm still reeling from, from uh, this, that brief little phrase, Chris, that you spoke about, that God, we gave God the gift of death that God took from us the gift of dying, and, he, and, he, and we took from him the gift of, of becoming divine. That of all the things of our imagined um, sacrifices, that, you know, acts of, uh, of worship or virtue, that, that of all the things that we could possibly offer God, the one that he chose to receive from us was death. That's a pretty good exchange, I think. Yes. A pretty good, a pretty good exchange. Yeah. Yeah, but don't lose sight of the end game. Right. You know, this uh, can't ever just be one half of that exchange. Yeah, yeah. This, of all the images that we've looked at, is the most complicated, apparently chaotic, and a little bit overwhelming. Can you walk us through? Can you train our eye, Dennis? I'll see what I can do. I, this is another little tiny image. It's uh, it's the size of this piece of paper. Okay, and it's by Sandro Botticelli, very famous. Early Italian Renaissance painter. It's the only painting he ever signed with his own name, so people suspect it was very important to him. And this was just around the time Savonarola was preaching in Florence, and this is sort of height of, of uh, sort of intellectual and religious fervor. And so you have in the center, you know, I, I threw, threw some lines here so you can see it's really got a, a three part uh, structure. In the middle is the part we know, and at the top is this angelic opening of the sky, and then uh, down here in the earth. So the middle part is the kind of scene that we know. You know, Christ is born in a cave that's a stable, and you never quite know what did this what did this stable look like. Um, I actually was visited the Holy Land of the Seminarians many years ago, and I saw these caves in the hills, and then they would build a little fence around the front of it. This is the Holy Land thing. The animals would go in the cave, and it was bad weather, and then they'd come out in the pens. So it's both a stable and a cave. But this is also a very uh, meaningful uh, thing, especially in the iconic tradition. The cave was the dark place of emptiness and coldness, and it was the center of the earth in a way. And so Christ is born in the cave. He's born into the darkness of creation. The cave also provides protection. You know, if you're out in the wild and you need some protection, you need to go in a cave. So the cave is both safety and death at the same time. And of course, there's all this carpentry out here, and you know, Christ is a, is a carpenter. Uh, and you think about the one who has mastery over wood has the mastery over trees, right? And so the fall happens at the tree in the garden, and then the, the cross is the new tree of life, and then Christ is the one who knows how to use trees. And traditionally in ancient cultures, architects were the creators, so the architect was the father. And in the ancient world, the carpenter was also an architect. So St. Joseph, as an architect or a, or a carpenter, would have been a builder as well. Um, the carpenter was the restorer. So the carpenter was the restorer of creation, the architect was the builder. So Christ is the restorer of all creation. And so it's not just, hey, that's all they had. It's deep, significant um, stuff here. The angels are up there singing, you know, Gloria in excelsis Deo, which is the glory to God in the highest. It's what is um, sung to the shepherds. Um, and you see here the Virgin Mary, who's like this giant column, you know, separating the middle. Look at the neck on this donkey coming all the way down. In case you were bored, looking over here, you follow this line right to Christ's face. And the ox and the donkey are, are, are particularly telling. The ox was one of the animals sacrificed in the temple. So it was considered a clean animal. It represented the Jews. The donkey was not a clean animal. And so it represents the Gentiles. So you have the notion that Christ is born for the Jews and the Gentiles. Joseph is over here asleep. 
which is an old convention that he was an old man and probably didn't have too many lower urges, uh, so there was no threat to the Virgin Mary, and so he was always an old man asleep in the corner, which, you know, it's, it's one way of representing. Um, and on the one side here are the Magi, who are being brought by angels uh, to see the new king, on the other side are the shepherds. And shepherds, you know, were outside the city, they were um, out working with animals, they were not clean, they couldn't do temple worship properly, so they were the outsiders. The kings, of course, are the powerful ones uh, from the east who follow the star. And of course, that meant that God had to arrange the cosmos so that the right star would be in the right place on the right day. So even the movement of the stars was preordained by God and worshipped God by doing what it's supposed to do. See, Christ is also naked here and on this uh, sheet, so it's prefiguring him being laid into the tomb uh, on the sheet as he's reaching up for his mother, but you could also say reaching uh, for the cross. And here at the bottom part are angels and human beings embracing and uh, kissing. People don't know exactly uh, about Shelley's reason for this, people speculate that it's a reference to Psalm 85, that mercy and faithfulness will meet, righteousness and peace will kiss, and faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from heaven. So here are all the humans who've been separated uh, from God, so to speak, in the fallen world, and now they're being welcomed back, just like the kiss of peace uh, that Christ gives to the apostles or that we give uh, at Mass. Maybe you can see on the right over here, and on the left, there are two little demons, I think, oh, I don't have a detail of them, but they're, they're right there. And they're running in fear, and they're going back down into their kind of hellish underground because they've lost. And so they're, uh, there they are. And then the top part, you can see, suggests that this isn't just an earthly event of a human baby being born. The heavens are open, the angels are rejoicing. It's like this great portal into uh, divinity. The angels are wearing red, white, and uh, green, which are the traditional colors for faith, hope, and charity. And they have olive branches in their hands which are the sign of peace, again, between God and humanity, it's the olive branch that the dove brought to, to Noah in the ark. They're also carrying these crowns for the queenship of Mary, and they have uh, ribbons that have little names on them. These were called the 12 uh, Privileges of the Virgin Mary. It was actually a prayer developed by Savonarola. And I, I brought them some of the names here. Spouse of the Father, Mother of God, Singular Tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, Virgin of Virgins, Queen honored above all creatures, and uh, so on. So the idea was this set of prayers would be a crown for the Virgin Mary, and then here they are in this crown shape uh, over uh, the Virgin there. So they call this the mystical nativity because it's not just a silent night. It's the connection between heaven and earth. It's the indication that humanity is rescued uh, through the action of Christ. The, the big, the small, the pure, the weak, the rich, the poor, and they're all kind of going to be transported up into this great golden opening of the, of the heavenly beyond. That's a lot of thinking to do, to think of a painting. It's hard enough to interpret it, never mind thinking of it on the other side and then fitting it all in a 12-inch in a uh, painting. It's, it's quite a tour de force by uh, Botticelli. These were great fun to research, by the way. I like, was just reading other articles. Like, wow, this is amazing stuff. Yeah, Joseph's going to get you for that comment, though. <laughs> Say, Joseph's going to get you for that. <laughs> I, I find the image of uh, Mary's face in this illustration is there's many beautiful depictions of her face but that's probably the most beautiful I've ever seen that's really very strong right? Yeah. very peaceful yeah. you know something about all these works of art is none of these figures look like anyone you would see on the street if you, sometimes people are now reviving what they call traditional painting and they, they want it to look very realistic because we went through the 70s and 60s where everything looked kind of strangely monstrous and just, just distorted. And if you're too literal, you just paint a portrait of your model in a Halloween costume, which is not what you want to do. So there's this abstracting out the particularity of the individual and capturing the immensity of, of what they actually signify. So, you know, you really will never see a woman who looks exactly like that. And yet, the nature is there. So this is her nature brought to a kind of elevated condition uh, beyond the mere humanity. And that's what real art that becomes transparent to the divine is always going to be more than what's natural. It's trying to show you the supernatural, and that brings us a whole set of other conventions that might look a little strange. You know, preset mass isn't supposed to be your buddy on the way down the aisle. Hey, how are you doing? What's up? Right there. They are an icon of Christ walking into the world about to offer sacrifice to the Father. And so they're, the way they move, the way they speak, what they wear, uh, is all to suggest something higher and better than the merely natural. It doesn't mean natural is bad, 
But liturgical things are always trying to anticipate that heavenly condition when things are restored and brought to their, their glorious uh, fulfillment. So it's an anticipation of the future glory. A, a cutting of the gem. Yeah. Not know. just, I mean, a, a rough cut diamond? You might walk by it on the street and not even know you think it's a broken bottle, but then when it's polished, it actually gets total internal reflection or nearly total internal reflection, which means the light goes in and it doesn't come out. How about that? The light of Christ is the light of the saints. This is what the book of Revelation says. There's no sun or moon in heaven because they're lit up from within. This is the iron plus fire image that St. Irenaeus talks about. If you put iron in the fire, it's, it's not light from the outside. It glows from the heat. And it's the same thing, except now it radiates this energy. And that's the image of the gem, that all this light stays in there. And then when it does come out, it's, uh, it's more glorified and more glorious to look at. Much to ponder. I don't want to exhaust this image either, so I'd like to maybe um, maybe wrap up. We want to open up for Q and A. I want to give you all a chance to ask some questions of Chris and Dennis. Um, but maybe before before we do so, I just want to maybe put in one more not plug, but uh, encouragement to to look at the book to. to to get a hold of it, um, in addition to these reflections, which are quite deep and worth revisiting. Uh, again, there's these practices, songs, uh, food, ways of speaking, and different activities that can be done individually or corporately, communally, that uh, I, I found quite interesting because you're absolutely right. We do have an interest in these things. We've lost, in a sense, a touch uh, being in contact with with our roots, and these things go deeply into our roots. And so I, I think what you've put together is really marvelous, and I hope, I hope it will build up the church in, in our time. It's very much needed. So please, a round of applause for these. So I want to invite you all to come forward. Nicole here has just turned on. Our mics are live, so if you'd like to come forward and ask a question, um, I'll give you a minute and ask one on my own. How about that? And you can compile your thoughts. Does that sound okay? How are the questions the most fun? Ask a good, hard, challenging question. Okay. So I'd like both of you to answer this, but Dennis, maybe first. I came across recently this beautiful quote from C.S. Lewis where he said, there's a, there's a peculiar modern habit that we have of doing ceremonial things unceremoniously as a sign of our humility. And that it doesn't actually prove our humility. What it proves is that we're incapable of forgetting about ourselves and it ruins the proper pleasure of ritual for everyone else. <laughs> and I'm sorry, this is too long a question. We said we would resolve to have only one breath worth of questions. So what is the proper pleasure of ritual? Well, ritual, Chris knows a lot about ritual, but the character of ritual is not natural. I'm, I'm teaching class Benedict, and right now, music and Catholic liturgy. And was reading this book by Joseph Jeleno, who's a Jesuit. He wrote a lot of tomes for responsorial songs after we first started doing them after Vatican II. So if you go to Mass and you might see, it says Joseph Jeleno under the, the musical notes of the responsorial song. And he makes the point that ritual is never merely natural, because the same reason as before, it's supernatural. And so, you know, you see me, and for whatever, better or for worse, this is who I am. If I'm going to be transparent to the divine, I'm not going to walk around in my boxer shorts, you know, and just do whatever, right? Eat chocolate in front of the TV. There's something you expect that someone who's becoming an icon of something higher and better is going to be, what they wear, how they move. And so he makes the point that if you're going to have access to the divine, and sacramental things are always made up of two parts, which is the matter, but there's this invisible reality that's trying to break through. And if the matter doesn't do what it needs to do to make something higher and better come through, it becomes opaque. And so it's actually a kind of pride on the, on the um, person who refuses to do the ritual. Oh, well, I won't do that, even though it sounds like humility. I don't want to look all, you know, stiff and unapproachable. It's like, no, you're trying to become transparent to this heavenly reality and let people encounter it. When people encounter that reality, they're transformed by it. And so there's this fine balance between losing your humanity entirely, and especially as a sovereign, and becoming a, a transparent uh, icon of Christ. We've all seen the cantor who you just know wishes they had fulfilled their dream to be a Broadway singer. And you know how distracting that is, right? <laughs> Alleluia, look at my big gesture. I said, no, no. 
what you know. How do you become invisible to the word? How does your personality disappear so that the song of heaven being sung around the throne of God can be known in its heavenly condition? That takes the real humility is to minimize the emotional expression and maximize the revelation of the being. <laughs> That's humility, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Beautifully said. Yes, please. please. Uh, this question might be more pointed towards Dennis. Um, but can you speak to uh, just having in your home uh, beautiful art, fine art, and uh, especially art that glorifies God? Um, I think that's something that just in the past couple of weeks I've been thinking about quite a bit. And just, I don't know, having something that when other people walk into your home, uh, it points them in a direction that hopefully we're all wanting to be pointed in. So just kind of hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah, well, you know, all art, like language, is a set of signs, right? So signs convey information. In the liturgical sphere, in a liturgical setting, inside a church, if you saw, uh, you know, a great mural on the wall back here of Christ and majesty surrounded by angels and saints, that would be the liturgical image. That's actually our capacity to see what's already happening. Christ on the throne, he's king of heaven and earth, and the angels and saints are around uh, adoring him. That's a pre-existing reality that we actually get to encounter through matter. So if you start to think, okay, here is the use of matter to make active and present a pre-existing spiritual reality, you start to see how close this comes to the idea of a sacrament. It makes a visible and invisible reality. That would be something at the highest level. In the Eastern churches, they call icon sacraments, which kind of bugs us in the West because we think there are seven sacraments and that's it. Uh, but sacrament in the broadest sense means matter is revealing uh, some otherwise unknowable and encounterable reality. So that would be the high level. And then you extend that out. Okay. Well, maybe we have a public uh, cross. You know, you go through these hikes in Switzerland or Germany, and you see these crosses, the wayfarers' crosses, and it extends the mission of the sacred image and the sacred liturgy out into the world. And then you do it in your own home. It's not a sacrament per se anymore, uh, but you could call it a sacramental. Right? Sacramentals dispose you to receive grace, and then it invites discussion. And especially if it's beautiful, people will say, "Oh, what is that?" You know, how often you know, are you going to put a book, uh, you know, Chris's book out on the table and someone says, oh, please tell me the content of the sacramental theology. Of course they would, it's Chris's book. But <laughs> generally speaking, that's kind of hard. You put a beautiful statue of the Virgin Mary and you ask, oh, where did you get that? What's that straight? Why is he holding grapes? What, what, what does the colors mean? That's an invitation to by something beautiful to engage in the discussion. So art has lots of, of um, different uh, ways of supporting us. Encounter the realities of heaven support us in our devotional uh, life, uh, and then to remind us constantly that we're coming from liturgy, going to liturgy, and then inviting others to, in, to share in the same beauty and delight that, that we delight. So, uh, I guess, you know, thumbs up on art in your, on your home. Yeah. You might be familiar with the practice on the Sacred Heart, it's called the Home Enthronement, where you enthrone an image or a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the literature about this speaks of it. Uh, so your home is called a domestic church, and so you enthrone uh, uh, an image of the presence of Jesus, and it, it, sometimes it's almost called a tabernacle in the home. I mean, it's not a tabernacle. But you see all the parallels between uh, the church and the domestic church, a place of Jesus, a prayer corner, the presence of Jesus, and so, uh, yeah, I think those types of images can help to transform a home or even a school or a workplace or whatever it is into you know, through these sacramental images through the place of Christ. So. Yeah, and classically, you know, one of the classic definitions of beauty is the attractive power of the truth or the compelling power of the truth. So my office, I've been in you know, the fourth floor of Bishop Fink Hall, uh, which not too many people go up to. There's no elevator yet, and it's hard to get up there. <laughs> but I keep the door open, and if you're coming from one direction, it's big golden icon on the wall. I bought it on an online auction, and I thought it was about this big, and I didn't look at the measurements. Turns out it's like three and a half feet high. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the wall, and people walk by, and they stop, and they're like, oh, what's that? And I'm like, hey, come on in. Oh, I, I just saw this beautiful thing, and then all of a sudden, we're talking, and who are you? What are you doing here? And how, where did this come from? And then I show them a little video of it getting uh, cleaned um, in Orland Park, and then we start talking about conservation of art. And before you know it, this beautiful thing has drawn people in to ask about the truth. And that's the classic definition, is that it's the splendor of the truth, it's the attractive power of the truth. I call it like the deliciousness of the truth. It's something that makes us want it. 
And so beautiful things uh, stir desire uh, for the good. And so the more we can do that, the more we have this evangelical uh, model. You all know, you have friends from out of town. What church do you take them to? Redemptorist church or the 1980s church in your town? I mean, you know the answer, right? The beauty attracts you to the downtown uh, churches. And then you start asking, what's that? Why is that weird thing painted on the ceiling? What's that winged ox? Uh, you know, it's kind of strange. And then it becomes an invitation to discuss the truth. And hopefully people are convinced by the truth, and then they say, I'm going to live that way. And then they live the life of the good. So beauty to truth uh, to goodness is one of the things that's been recommended in our time by Pope um, Francis to some degree, but Benedict and, and John Paul especially. Well, I'm firmly in favor of cigarette at home for no other reason than what else are you going to put on the spot where your TV used to be? <laughs> Well, you know, we had the, the solemnities, and um, I went to ones that I thought I could write something meaty about. Right? Some, you know, you, after Trent, there was a lot of argument about uh, images being too complicated. The Protestants were complaining that we had all this questionable theology, these medieval images of you know, demons flying around and stuff. And so there were these rules that came out. There can be no unusual image in a painting. It's, it's something after, during Trent. Well, what is an unusual image? There's a certain lifelessness to a lot of the post trend You just see a big Mary with a little Jesus and an angel in the background. Okay, but what do you say about that, right? So a lot of them are actually before Trent because there's this richness and layers of meanings and secondary narratives and tertiary narratives. And I thought, well, this, this gives you, I mean, a thousand words we had for each of these. There's, you know, four pages or so. And I didn't just want to say over and over again, Mary is preserved from sin and Jesus is the Son of God. You know, that we all know that, right? How can we do a Where's Waldo kind of post? <laughs> what is that weird thing in that painting? Uh, there's a big painting of the resurrection um, by Raphael when he was 16. And in the background, there's this little lily, right? Like, okay, lily, Easter, that's what we do. And then someone, where, why do we do that? Well, it turns out the lily, if you've ever planted one, it doesn't look very nice in the fall. It's like this dried up brown papery onion. It's for all you know is dead. You put it in the ground, and then in the spring, it rises up from the ground and has this sweet fragrance and this sweet, delightful thing to look at. And they said, oh, this is an analog of the resurrection. And so we do this in Easter. And so the paintings like that that have lots of things to research and tell little stories about were the ones that attracted me. And so the 15th century, a lot of the paintings are from that period because they look like that. There are a couple from the 20th century, though, the most recent renewal of art, one by Leonard Porter. Uh, as a painter in New York, to say that there are painters today who are doing really beautiful stuff as well. <coughs> of the 17 solemnities, were these all formerly Holy Days of Obligation? And if so, how did we get to where we are today? Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, currently, there are 10 Holy Days of Obligation on the Universal Church. Uh, so not every one of the 17 solemnities is a Holy Day of Obligation, but every Holy Day of Obligation is a solemnity. Um, the, the calendar prior to the Reform is rather confusing, at least to me. Um, they were ranked, as far as I know, as solemnities, feast memorials. There were doubles of the first class and of the second class and things like that, and I've never really... Uh, sat down to get it straight uh, in my mind. So I don't know if there's sort of a parallel type of, you know, what 100 years ago, what would, if we had this presentation 100 years ago, what would it look like? I'm not quite sure. But I don't think it's ever been the case that every solemnity is a holy day of obligation. Right? So there are such things as proper uh, solemnities as well. So uh, if your parish is St. Philip Mary or mine is St. Philip. So on May 3rd, that's a solemnity for St. Philip Parish where I go to church. Um, that's not a holy day of obligation. So it, um, they're not, I don't think they ever have been equated. They're related, but they've never been equated. So, great question. So my question is, if you were put in charge of let's say a church renovation or something like that, and maybe you wanted to restore some murals that used to be and are no longer 
or start from scratch? How would you go about doing that? How would you make decisions about what things you would put on the walls? And like, how would you, how would you go about that? Well, this is what I do pretty much every day of my life. So uh, <laughs> I've been working with a pastor in Minnesota, actually. He had a church kind of like this. I uh, had paintings all over it, and it was all painted in beige at some point. A lot of churches. All the <laughs> things were taken out. It was a big white church. They left two angels up in the ceiling from the original parish, and that was all that was left. And so they looked at some old photos. And this is, in fact, the, the fellow you recommended I talked to from the net. And... Um, he said, well, we looked at the old photos. Let's reproduce what the old photos did. Okay, a little bit more than they had. But I tried to encourage them to think, well, just because it's old doesn't mean it's good, right? Sometimes in the 19th century, they were not very theologically sophisticated. They put stuff everywhere. There'd be devotional things larger than liturgical things. Or there'd be no liturgical sense at all. There'd be no Christ and majesty. You'd have you know, Philip Neri levitating, you know, and that was, that was the big picture on the wall, right? So I said, okay, if the church building is this image of the heavenly Jerusalem, this is the heaven that we hear about in the book of Revelation. You know, what is that like? It's centered on God. You know, some of these images we've been seeing, centered on God, on Christ on his throne. It's a new heaven and a new earth. So we developed the scene where there's a river at the bottom, kind of right where the yellow turns to white here. There's a river going across. That's something I learned from the um, Basilican churches in Rome. Very often they put the Jordan River there. So you see Christ above and the throne. And you see palm trees because it's the new garden of Eden. And then the Jordan River, and the, it's kind of strange. Why would the Jordan River be there? And it finally hit me that what's on the other side of the Jordan River? The, the promised land, right? And so water is this barrier in Scripture a lot, whether it's the Red Sea or whatever. And so now on one of them, I think it's St. Paul inside the walls, there's a little angel windsurfing on the Jordan River. <laughs> Actually windsurfing from the 8th century. Now the Jordan River is not only a barrier, it's fun, right? So this is a theological and liturgical way of thinking. The new heaven and the new earth centered on God. The heavenly components of the, of the uh, assembly include the angels who are praising God, the saints who are praising God, the persons of the Trinity are perfectly praising each other and receiving from each other. The souls of purgatory are members of the worshiping assembly because although they're not in full communion yet, they're waiting for that day and they're praising God from their place of waiting. And uh, they even put some uh, walleye uh, and some pheasants in there because that's they like to hunt those things and fish for those things up there. So they thought, okay, even this place will be glorified at the end of time. And so this is abstract concept, heaven and Jerusalem, but what it means is our heaven and our earth will be uh, glorified. And they chose to paint the ceiling in dark blue with patterns of stars because stars are created by God. And if you've ever done the Liturgy of the Hour, Sunday morning, week one, you hear all these things, praise the Lord, and it's not people, it's stars and, and water creatures and frost and chill and ice and snow bless the Lord. Like, why do they do that? What's your favorite line? How does do bless the Lord, Chris? I love this joke. By doing what do does. Which is being doing. Being doing, yeah. <laughs> so um, you say, oh yeah, the stars moving in their orbits are obeying God's will. And just like they landed in the right place in the day of the age I had to find them, uh, they're praising God. So sometimes you actually see signs of the zodiac in old churches up in the ceiling. It gets people nervous. They think it's some kind of weird Gene Dixon prediction thing. Um, but the, how many signs of the zodiac are there? Theoretically, 12. How many tribes of Israel are there? 12. How many apostles are there? 12, right? So God spoke to the Jews. God spoke to the Gentiles. And then he spoke to the people outside, even the Gentiles, who were from the east. They were outside of that. And so... There's a cosmic dimension of liturgy. There's uh, all of creation worships God. Everything's glorified. Everything's centered on God. It's populated. Um, that's the theological principle. And then you say, okay, well, what's your saint? Saint whoever. Well, we'll put him right next to the throne and we'll give him a slightly different clothing. This is the liturgical imagery that Vatican II wanted. If you read Vatican II carefully, it doesn't say much about art, but it says it's composed of signs and symbols of heavenly realities. And it's a foretaste of the heavenly reality. It anticipates the second coming where we join our voices with the warriors and the angels and the saints. And what do we do most of the time? We put Joseph over there, Mary over there, and a crucifix on the wall, and we think we're done. But that's like a 1% solution of the heavenly Jerusalem. We want the 100% solution here. And that's how I'd start. Everything inside is perfected and glorified and radiant. I've been hot for the last couple of months on comparing it to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I know you've heard me say this, Chris. But you know that moment in the first movie and they open the door and they walk around in the garden and there's the chocolate river and all that stuff and Gene Wilder starts singing, come with me and you'll see the world of pure imagination. 
You should walk in your church and he should be able to say, come with me and you'll see the world glorified and eschatological. <laughs> look at the angels, look at the saints. And you can't fall in the river either. You know? And so if you walk into church and you say, hello, all right, that's a missed opportunity. If you say, I walk in this church, I don't know if I'm in heaven and earth anymore because the matter of this world has become transparent of the realities, the beings, the glory of heaven. And everything God wants us to know about Him, and you just want to kneel down and pray, that's what you should do. But it has an intellectual rooting that's really specific, right? It's the vision of uh, St. John's um, view through the sky into heaven. That's all you have to do? It's easier said than done. Anybody write that down? Yeah. <laughs> one, one more question. Well, for the uh, budding young. Maybe like the ones here at Chesterton. Uh, what would you give them advice if they were looking to maybe make a painting for the Solemnity of Christ the King? What would it be that they would do before ever putting pen to paper to prepare themselves to, you know, maybe hopefully achieve things like that? What would you like? You, Dennis, you're starting to allude to this earlier. This is a great mystery that gets revealed through a whole different number of human means, through songs and traditions and foods and languages, through prayer and texts and other things like that, or through art. So I would think um, before a brush is ever put to, can, is it canvas, is that what painters use? Okay, whatever. Uh, it's to, uh, you know, be familiar with the mystery. Christ the King, for example, um, know what its uh, ontology or teleology is, know what the mystery is about, how it's been expressed uh, in prayers and in culture and in history, and I suppose in art too, and maybe probably only after that's been done, then some of the more uh, 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 proximate preparation take place. Yeah, in the, in the tradition of icons, iconographers are very serious. They have to fast and pray so that their, their natural inclinations to be expressive, right, self-expressive, as the artists always want to be expressive, can calm down and they allow the Holy Spirit to guide their intellect in their hands. So you never see, almost never see an icon uh, that's signed in authentic uh, iconography by the artist. Sometimes it will say painted by the hand of Brother Alexandros or something. In other words, the Holy Spirit guided his hand and it wasn't the, whole, the iconographer's thing. So pray. And even, I don't know if you guys are ready to fast, you know, at your age, but maybe, you know, give up some candy or something for a day and say, Holy Spirit, you know, I've denied my natural inclination to desire, you know, concupiscent things, and please now fill it with your presence. How do you know what Christ the King is? Well, what's a king? I mean, we have, in America, we don't like kings, we have George III and all that stuff. But biblically, a king is a bringer of justice. A king is someone who would die for his people to save them. Whose, whose fundamental approach is to bring justice and, um, and squash evil, lay down his life for his people. Yeah, what, what kind of person would do that? You know, do we have that intention? So you want, the thing about Christ as king is he's got to be a tough, I don't want to say what I want to say. But, you know, he's got to be able to crush the devil, right? He's got to be strong. But on the other hand, the only reason he bothered with all of this is because he loves us, right? So how do you combine sort of Arnold schwarzenegger -y stuff with, you know, intense love. Um, and so his strength is not earthly. It's not bodybuilder. His strength is intentional and love. I had to give a talk about beauty to a, a men's group uh, last spring. I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? And I found this quote from uh, Maximilian Kolbe, who said, the love, of, the love of Christ is stronger than death. So that's what I call the talk, stronger than death. Right? Death cannot... Uh, break the love um, we have. A mom who pushes her baby out of the way of an oncoming car and gives her life for a child. That's stronger than death. That's love stronger than death. Christ is king. is stronger than death. Gave up his life for his people. Always out of love. So he's not angry, but he's not a marshmallow, right? There's somewhere in between. How do you combine strength and love and ultimate power to crush the head of the serpent? How do you get that in the eyes of, a, of an image of Christ? It's hard stuff. And this should scare, I mean, it should scare you a little bit, right? I don't want to scare you from, off from painting your, your image. But it should be scary. I don't know how to render present in matter the divinity of Christ. It's scary stuff. So approach it with a little bit of fear and then say, 
Holy Spirit, guide my hand, and then just be trustworthy and uh, let him work in you. Oh, no, trusting, not trustworthy. Trust, well, trustworthy too, but trusting, and then let God work in you. Amen. Well, uh, we want to allow time for some more conversation if you, if you would like, but I want to conclude the formal portion of the program tonight, if that's okay, unless there's any parting remarks that you'd like to share with us. Okay. I do have a request. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. So, you can't see this now, but underneath that glorious beard that Chris Carstens is wearing on his face, there's a famous actor. Uh, How many of you have ever seen Terminator 2? Do you remember the liquid robot, the liquid Terminator? So long ago, this man was clean shaven and could see the clear resemblance of the liquid Terminator whose arms could turn into swords at any second. It makes the study of liturgy a little more exciting. (laughs) So as a parting gift to us all, Chris, would you give us the finger wag of the T-1000? There it is. (laughs) Glorious. Glorious, thank you. A big round of applause for my friends. Chris.